people have asked me about some of the older books I have collected over the years which were published and made available to the public some of them were even put into public libraries but the mainstream media never made much of them they didn't mention them because the mainstream media's job is to make you think about things which your betters have decided you should think about and they tell you all that they've decided you need to know but legally those who plan your lives in such an intricate spider web interconnecting way are so legalistic they do allow their books to be put out into the hands of the public at least a lot of them not all of them obviously because so much is still and always will be classified as top secret and comes under security under the guise of security they can keep everything stamped and put away in vaults for as long as they wish to this is an ongoing process even after the main NAFTA or free trade negotiations the actual free trade negotiations was a precursor of NAFTA it was the major setting up of the unification for the Americas only a, a, an actual edited report was given and made available to the public the rest was sealed and not for public consumption and put in a vault outside Ottawa where it will stay for 30 to 50 years we don't live in a society of freedom that's the illusion that we're given from television and they keep telling you you're so free you live in the freest countries in, in the world that's all part of the, the illusion creation the more they say it the more people believe it and when you show them something that's not on the mainstream media they disbelieve it they truly have been trained like Brzezinski said to, uh, to let the media do their reasoning and their thinking for them that's happened with most people but you can't blame the people since the indoctrination technique uh, starts at birth and continues throughout your whole life now one of the various books I have was taken from the Royal Institute of International Affairs world meeting one of their world meetings this particular one the topic was the British Commonwealth and the future it was published by Humphrey Milford and this was 1938 I think the meeting was in 37 however at the beginning of the book it says issued under the auspices of the Royal Institute of International Affairs the Canadian Institute of International Affairs the Australian Institute of International Affairs New Zealand Institute of International Affairs the South African Institute of International Affairs and the Indian Institute of International Affairs for India there are more now all and all the non-commonwealth countries now after 45 are called Council and Foreign Relations such as the one in the US underneath those listed it says the Institute of International Affairs is in the British Commonwealth are included by their rules are precluded by their rules from expressing as institutes an opinion on any aspect of international or imperial affairs any opinions expressed in this book are therefore not those of the institutes as a disclaimer and they're quite right because they don't talk about politics they simply have a plan which is world government politics is a lower show for the public to believe in the Punch and Judy show that they used to show in the middle ages going around the villages and I think this book initially too was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation 
So it has all the minutes of the meetings. It's got the lists of all the members in the back, who they are. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. Politicians from all countries as well. Labour unions, because like Carl Quigley said, who was the historian um, for the Council on Foreign Relations, for a while he said that uh, we, that means the Institute, uh, have no problems conversing and working with communists, capitalists, dictators, and so on, and frequently do so. And they do because they're all part of it, you see at the top. Now the whole idea of this dominion, this political commonwealth they had of Britain, was set up not just to be a commonwealth, but to eventually bring in other countries. They knew that they changed the name of their organization, eventually creating the League of Nations. The League of Nations was funded into existence by the British government, even though the United States put capital in as well and pretended not to take part in it after Wilson. They did take part in it. They had so-called unofficial members at every meeting. The League of Nations was to be the embryo based on the British system of world government. And they knew that they'd have to a hard task, a very hard task to convince the populace of the world to accept it. They had to get a different name. It couldn't be allied to Britain or the United States or any of the colonial powers. So they had to give it a new name under the guise of a knight in shining armor. It's a trick that's been used down through the centuries. But it was definitely set up to be the embryo of world government based on the British system of free trade and interdependence. A concept going back to John Dee, who first coined the term British or British Empire and proposed this system. The Queen was but the first of a world empire. To sell the idea of a world empire you must bring in all leaders from all groups. And when you don't have enough groups to give it some sort of public official backing, then you create the groups that speak on the public's behalf. But you always make sure that you put in the leader. Old technique. At these meetings, anyone who was anyone in decision making in the country, any country was present from left wing, right wing, far left, far right, and up and down. They all belonged to it, dictators too. So Britain and the empire was to be the basis for a, a League of Nations, which was to transform with more power after a period of time into the United Nations. Mainly to convince the public in a long-term plan that they must give up not just their national identity, but they must adopt a new culture which would be made for them, for a world system, the world system that others working for the British government and the British aristocracy at that time, like Bertrand Russell, called a world run by experts. But it had to be sold to the public, mainly, as helping the public. That's how you do it. You create a mouse trap, as they say in commerce, and allow the mouse to come in, then you grab them and you use them for the real reason. That's how this system works. In other words, the people are the last ones to know the real purposes behind it. But you'll be told all the good stuff to get you into the mouse trap. In this book, it says on page 258, it's under the title A World Order, several delegates, more especially from the left political wing, 
urged that no world order could be built save on a better social order. A world order, said one, implies the rule of justice, internal as well as international, social as well as political. He then went on to espouse the fact they would use the labour standards of Britain to bring the working people on board, basically, to cooperate towards this order. And just above this, on the same page, 258, it states here, More than one delegate remarked that once the Commonwealth basis was achieved, there was no reason why the control should not be international, and many reasons why it should, and the members of the conference were brought back to their conceptions of a world order by the question, how can you get international control without international government? Well, you see, they they knew... Ultimately, it would evolve into international government. In page 278, he goes on to say, The Commonwealth order, we may surmise, is only a path to a world order. The conference discussion suggested that this gradual assimilation might happen in the economic as well as the political sphere where the Commonwealth would then continue or pass away as having fulfilled its usefulness would be for some British Commonwealth Relations Conference of the future to discuss. This was based as well, remember, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs on another group which had been born in the 1800s, the Cecil Rhodes Society and Foundation, given a royal charter to exist because they were in effect a front group technically non-governmental so they could get away with doing a lot in the world without governments being blamed as backing them Lord Milner, Alfred Milner joined the Round Table Societies with the Rhodes Foundation and this made the nucleus for the League of Nations which is the United Nations and you still have the the round table societies working on different problems like think tanks do on how to make us all interdependent on page 260 it says there did not appear however to be any dissent from one proposition that an eventual world order involved an encroachment on national sovereignty and that this must be a slow and difficult business. Here was a highly important point in connection with the future of the Commonwealth itself. For if the effort towards a world order is one of the unifying factors of the Commonwealth and if complete national sovereignty is antipathetic to a world order, then complete national sovereignty cannot be more than a transitional phase of Commonwealth relations themselves. The essence of a true league that was put to the conference is that no member has the right of neutrality. One speaker himself, a strong believer in the domain's right to neutrality, said plainly that a real league must mean a super state. He's talking about world government. A delegate referred in an expressive phrase to a society of independent, interdependent states, among which he said, Association for Mutual Defence was quite possible. A similar phrase was indeed used of the British Commonwealth itself. On page 261, they discussed the following. Several delegates felt the problem of a world order to be intimately bound up with that of strengthening the friendly relations which all agreed to be necessary between the nations of the British Commonwealth and the United States. A Canadian spoke of the paradox that while participation in collective security was impossible for the United States, her collaboration was more easily achieved and her suspicion of British policy less acute when the latter was directed to upholding the principle of collective security and a world order. One of those who would identify the steps towards a world order with a a leaguing of the democratic states against dictatorships remarked that the United States and the Commonwealth had a great common interest in the fact that the Nazi philosophy was death to both. Page 
to them both. Remember, the war wasn't declared at that time. It's pre-World War II. A delegate with very different political ideas pointed out that American suspicions towards Great Britain and France was nothing to American aversion towards the dictatorship states. While some delegates drew attention to the growing participation of the United States in international organization and action, a Canadian member of the conference argued that the breakdown of the political side of the League had made American participation in a revived League less likely and that the way back was through a cooperative League linking up different regional Leagues of a very similar character, including no doubt the Pan-American Union. 1938. A world order, as United Kingdom delegates pointed out, will not wash out the diversities and perhaps regional cooperation may be the means of finding unity and diversity. You've heard that phrase before, unity and diversity, that's a con game that's been sold to all the countries that joined the European Union and now will be sold to the public as we're being merged into the American Union. I'm not interested in world unity, said the same delegate. I just want enough unity to, to provide the good life. And that's a term that uh, Huxley and others used, and Bertrand Russell. This same idea was presumably in the mind of the delegate who claimed a lonely voice. Their world order was a false objective. The present re- regional groupings of powers, which much more natural than any attempt at universality. So these guys were the ones who called the regions parts of the planet. They'd already mapped out the planet into regions. And regions, interestingly enough, is also taken from Masonic terms. They have their their areas which they call regions as well because all these guys uh, were members of Knights Templars and various other Masonic organizations, both left-wing, right-wing, and up and down. On page 223, the opening speaker on the chapter of the future of the Commonwealth as a cooperative organization. Interestingly, the report was made by Professor Sir Alfred Zimmern, Commission recorder. Now, Alfred Zimmern was uh, he was um, the kind of right hand man around Winston Churchill. Alfred Zimmern also was the head of the Communist Party at Britain at one time and was a publisher of his main newspaper. And we're told that Winston Churchill hated communists. You see, he hated them. And here he is with this character hanging around his neck, and he confided in him with complete trust because there's no war at the top you see never was and this is the recorder basically for this part of the talk they go on to again with the world order and mention the Balfour report of 1926 he says he considered that his conclusions were all contained in the Balfour report of 1926 which was after all the basis of the present position He went on to say that there was an impression in the Dominions that the statute of Westminster was given grudgingly. Given grudgingly. That's a statute, another thing should be read up by people. Nothing could be further from the truth, as he was able to say from personal knowledge. Down at the bottom of the page 223, it says, a fifth Canadian speaker mentioned this, he could conceive a situation arising in which a dominion might be involved in a war without involving other parts. For instance, a conflict between Japan and the United States in which Canada might be involved. Remember, this was before World War II, before Pearl Harbor. In page 221, it says... This conception of the Commonwealth as the nucleus of a system of world government was discussed from various angles, both in the session of that morning and at the two subsequent meetings of the Commission. So there you are. You see the the British Commonwealth was to be the nucleus of a world government. 
they created the, the League of Nations, transforming into the United Nations. And remember that every major media mogul on the planet attended this particular and other meetings that they have because they are your propagandists to train people intergenerationally towards global government. Their global government. Now a lot of people, I'm sure, will see this as quite a natural development and a, and a thing to work towards if they believe the real reasons are, are wars that are, as are given when the history books were caused by the reasons they tell you. But really, you're looking at the top tycoons on the planet whose beginnings go back to the old knights when they looted countries and then they created corporations like the British East India Company who set up all of this. So they get all the, the true believers working for them towards global government when they will have a little twist in the tail towards the end of it for the real reason. And we know what the real reason is going to be. And luckily we get clips of that from other players from the aristocracy like Bertrand Russell and like Galton Darwin. It goes through on other pages the plans for Australia including immigration policies that would take a while to introduce as they conditioned the public to accept what at that time would be non-white immigrants in they would start taking them in slowly over a long period of time from India and then even Arabic countries 1938 they even had the setting up of the west coast of Canada for Chinese immigrants because they knew at the time eventually they were going to set up China it's mentioned in this book too that China would eventually become a big economic power they knew it because they'd already had guys like Bertrand Russell working in China helping to set up the communist party to create nationalism which you must create before you create communism before you have dictatorship and before you end up having the new way, the third way, as it's called. This is a process. If you read Plato's books and other Greek philosophers' books, they go through the process from one type of system to the next as though it's a formula. And they say that democracy always ends up in dictatorship. Now, it should be noted that at this meeting... They talked about setting up sub-regions which would work quietly but efficiently and be well funded towards bringing those regions together in the same form as the rest of the world would be brought together. Those that would re resist more would have a slower time, more propaganda given to them. They'd be tied economically and politically and legally in such a way that they'd have no option uh, but to go along with this new system. They created the Institute for Pacific Relations. That's a branch of the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations to work on the Far East. And they created other ones as well all weaved together intricately like a big spider's web. On page 276, it says, The Commonwealth of the Future. The answer to the final question on the conference agenda, where there emerged from its discussions any new conception of the Commonwealth, must in the nature of things remain a personal one. The recorder of the Commission 4 has set down the various thoughts that were contributed to the pool of prophecy and practical political ideas. What follows is a distillation from that pool, but one inevitably flavoured with the personal opinions of the writer. One delegate with unanswerable realism said that the future of the Commonwealth was going to depend on the outcome of the next European war. Now, they knew it was coming because the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs, according to Quigley, helped drum up all the propaganda 
and get the fear going to get Britain into it. The, all the top newspaper guys were members. They told the British public lots of lies, had them digging ditches in the streets and the cities, and all wearing gas masks, thinking they were going to be gassed. It was all a big lie, according to Quigley. Few others, however, were not even, and not even he himself, were willing to speculate on what that outcome would be if a European war did break out. While the conference was held under the shadow of threatening war in Europe, his discussions of the future of the Commonwealth were based on the only assumption on which it was profitable to proceed, that existing trends would either be allowed, a period without war in which to work themselves out, or else would prove more potent than even those incalculable new forces which might be set up by a general war. The discussions at the conference inspired in one observer's mind a vision of a future commonwealth not static but dynamic, to borrow the phrase of an Irish delegate, dynamic within itself through the gradual working out of the principle of self-government, which will steadily increase the number of its own elect. Interesting, its own elect and gaining dynamic force from without by finding its inspiration in ideals that are broader than itself and can be brought to fruition only on a world scale. Individual and group freedom based on responsibility, peace as the condition of freedom, the brotherhood of all races, colors, and creeds. With its progress on this path, new problems will arise because they knew back then they were going to integrate and multiculturalize the world because the elite at the top, you see, who really are the bosses, see the peasantry of all peoples as just one big pool of labor. They don't care personally what color you think you are. And also, too, they also believed in a, a system where the individual would serve the world state, serve the world state. That would be your purpose in life. They knew that the progress on this path, new problems would arise because of conflicts of different cultures coming together. So it would take a long period to do, but they thought it could be done. Their dates were pretty well right, the 21st century. With its progress on this path, new problems will arise. The multiplication of sovereign states within its circle, as countries not yet ripe for self-government attain to full nationhood, and those already self-governing assume fresh responsibilities will give rise to new conundrums in constitutional relations and increase the existing difficulties of constructing uniform and universal machinery for cooperation in foreign policy and defense. Above all, the rise of non-white nations to self-government allied to the natural course of world events will drive racial and intercontinental questions more and more to the front of Commonwealth problems New attitudes of mind will become necessary, a discarding, no doubt, of the tacit assumption of which an Indian delegate complained that the British nations have a divine purpose to fulfill and have more to contribute than other nations to the fund of practical wisdom about race relations, a discarding, too, in the phrase of United Kingdom delegate, of condescension and the attitude of mind on both sides that always suspect something sinister in the other. The multiplication of states within the Commonwealth itself suggests the question whether it might not increase in the future by enrolling new members from outside. The delegates did not tackle in detail the practical problems involved in such a course, believing no doubt with an Irish member that the British nations must go further on their own road before inviting others into their circle. Moreover, Many people saw the possible future absorption of foreign countries in a process of assimilation rather than incorporation. The Commonwealth is a miniature world containing peoples of every color and from all countries, all continents. As it works out its own destiny, the world of which it is part will be struggling with the same problems on a larger scale. In a phrase used by a member of the conference at a public gathering after the conference itself had concluded, the Commonwealth should be an example to the world of what it would wish the world to be. Is it too much to imagine that gradually the Commonwealth and those parts of the world which have progressed so far or further in the art of self-government will become assimilated? The Commonwealth order, we may surmise, is only a path to a world order. 
The conference discussions suggested that this gradual assimilation might happen in the economic as well as a political sphere. Now, they knew this. That this, is, this is written rather weakly here because in their other books they, they go into this in more detail and all of the different uh, subgroups which they have. There's hundreds of them actually all allied to this. It was massive in its time, this organization, and it's much bigger today. And they go on to say that eventually the British Commonwealth would pass away having fulfilled its usefulness. In the back of the book, they have all the members who attended from all the countries. And it's worth interesting, if you, if you want to read some of their books, you can get their books, Royal Institute of International Affairs, from Chatham House, 10 St. James Square, London, SW1. I think they also have a branch in, the, in New York, for the CFR and that's the Pratt House or the Pratt Building this organization had all the Fabian leaders in it it had all the supposed far right leaders in it it's all one big club at the top and all the big media moguls attend it they shape the world they predict the future by making it happen Having worked out all the problems in advance, they have no problems with problems when they crop up. They've foreseen it all, you see. So complete integration of the planet. They, in, they go into a world court at the time that would eventually be used for the entire planet, but it would start for, as a sort of criminal court for tyrants. You may be seated. Stop, please. Uh, please sit down. But it would blossom into basically the only governmental court on the planet. Old stuff which has had a long time to plan and work and market its ideas from thousands of sources to the generations that have grown up since this particular meeting was held. One of many, many, many meetings. And there you have that part of it. So the British Commonwealth was set up initially to be a nucleus of world government. They have no problems talking about that. They have no problems admitting the League of Nations which became the United Nations, was modeled on the system and, and run by the same guys, really. And nothing's changed. And above these groups, there's higher groups, the Bilderbergers, the Club of Rome. Club of Rome deals mainly with depopulation, but by saying the opposite of what they're really all about. A planned society. The Bilderbergers have all the top moguls there. They have future presidents and prime ministers invited to attend. That's why you know they're going to be a prime minister or a president. And the queen or her representatives attend each meeting. And all the big bankers. Remember what H.G. Wells said. He said we must bring in to this federation those who understand economics so they brought the big bankers in on it. That's why the banking system, which runs our lives really, had to be brought in. And at the top, you have an aristocratic elite who've run the world for a long, long time. The psychopathic, we know where they're heading to. They have lots of workers working for them below at conference, or many of them thinking they're working for the betterment of mankind. But the ones at the top can't help but give themselves away every so often. But when you're planning a controlled society, I mean, you realize their answer to 
racial problems, cultural problems, and all the rest of it, is to basically engineer a new species of humanity, genetically, eventually, to serve them better at the top. Then perhaps everyone will stop fighting each other and see who the common enemy really is. And they'll find them in their own peoples at the top, your own top people, the psychopaths in the system of money, wealth, which is power, in the system, are psychopaths. There's no such thing as poor boy leaves ghetto and makes good, like the old Rothschild story. It's a nice little story for, for children, but it's so far from being true. read a little bit of the, the foreword in it. It says, this book is designed to furnish an official report of the second conference on British Commonwealth relations, which was held at Lapstone near Sydney in September of 1938. The conference was larger in numbers and, I think, perhaps more representative in character than the Toronto Conference of 1933. We of the Australian Institute were deep, deeply gratified that our invitation to hold the conference in Australia was accepted and still more that so many distinguished men should have joined the various delegations. The holding of the conference in Australia, or at all, was made possible only by the generous assistance we received from the governments of the Commonwealth and of the state of New South Wales, and also from the Carnegie Corporation and the Rhodes at Cecil Rhodes Trustees. I wish on behalf of the Australian Institute and on behalf of all the members of the conference to express our high appreciations of this assistance. So here is technically a group, massive, massive world. <laughs> it's a mountain which is funded by the big corporations. That's why the corporation foundations were set up in the first place run a world to fund those organizations which they would either create or take over to push certain social policies worldwide and also they got funding from the Commonwealth countries interesting eh? for non-governmental organization that plans your future states quite correctly that it doesn't discuss politics it doesn't it discusses social Proceedings, because it's a plan, it's a plan's agenda. You don't argue about it, it's a plan, you see. And yet on the previous page it says the British Commonwealth and the future proceedings of the second unofficial conference are in British Commonwealth relations, Sydney 3rd to the 17th of September 1938. One of many, another myriad that works for it is a club called the Empire Club. Anyone who's who in a country in business will try to become a member and they have again the members of the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the CFR going round as main speakers as guests to the Commonwealth Clubs and to the various other organizations. This myriad underneath them that controls our lives. On page 49 of the same book, it has here, this report was made by a Professor Scott, a study group in Victoria, B.C., after emphasizing the importance of relative standards of living to this question, reached the conclusion that where there are no restrictions, British Columbia could and would support a considerably increased population of Asiatic origin. Now, the reason for that was they knew they were setting up China eventually in the future to be a main manufacturer of the planet and they would need the middle man and the educated class to to manage the important exporting and so on. Nothing happens by accident, you see everything's planned so far ahead of time 
and people grow up and never know they're living through a long-term business plan. That's the real world we live in. And for many of the groups who help bring this to be, thinking they're working for the greater good, they're all being used. Because the higher group that runs all sides of everything. What the fuck is this? Have already told us what they want to do with us. We see it forming around us, the totalitarian states, going into one big global totalitarian prison camp with a planned future, a depopulation program coming from this wonderful egg that came out of the embryo of the League of Nations, now the United Nations. The big stick is starting to come out and we're seeing the force come in. And this is to be a very efficiently run world. They decided long ago they would do away with all conflict. Now, they meant all conflict right down to man and woman. They would destroy marriage. It would be obsolete. And it's all been pretty well formulated and, and completed. We're not dealing with little clubs here that make wish lists and have governmental funding to do so and meet in exotic faraway places. They plan the future, they have the means to implement it through propaganda. Since all your top magazine editors and newspaper men are there and the internet fellows. And they market our culture to us and upgrade it and keep on upgrading it just like you upgrade the virus programs on your computer. That's the real world we live in. A planned society. Then when you start devaluing life itself, which was a must be, you see, you can't allow horror for the future, new types of human beings to be created, purpose-made human beings, intelligent design ID. Unless you have become desensitized to what it is to be human in the first place. And everyone has had that through the way the presentations have been marketed to us on abortions and science with its, its hype about how wonderful to have all these organs to save lives and possibly stem cell research will save us all down the road. It's always a big carrot for us to go along with it as they bring more horror upon us until we've just dehumanized ourselves, we've lessened our own self-worth when we allow it to be done to others. So when they come knocking at your door, who's there to stand up for you? They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That maxim holds true for many of those who help bring a, about what they think is going to be a, a utopia for everyone. Because they are so naive and disbelieving in the fact that there are people who can pretend so well, act so well, that they care at the top of this tree but who actually want to eliminate a good part of the planet. Now Arthur C. Clarke that I've mentioned a few times, who wrote a sort of scenario out in allegorical form of the system beginning for 2001 to kick it all off big time, the next big push, 2010 for the completion of most of it. But then he takes you in his book, his last one, 3001, through a journey into a future where they're down to one, one billion people on the planet. And even then in the book, the car one of the characters is complaining that's too many. It 
is a chip society. It also has the direct thought-to-thought -thought control electronic equipment working, which we know was discussed at Loyola University with a brain implant for control purposes. These guys don't make this stuff up. They're given the facts of the plan and they write stories around them which fascinate young people. Everyone is fascinated when they're young in science fiction. It's predictive programming so that when it actually comes into being in your lifetime, because it's familiar to you, you accept it without question. It's a normal progression. We are up against pretty well everything that you take for granted, all of the agencies and organizations which you hear mentioned briefly on little news clips are non-governmental organizations, unelected people and representatives from these organizations run your lives. From all sources, mainly from media and marketing, because marketing is one of the biggest tools they must use in conjunction with television and all advertising. They market ideas to us continuously all the time. We also have secrecy under the guise of national and international security on advanced technologies. for the public are never told, never, ever, ever told what they actually have until 50 to 80 years later. Then it's obsolete, in fact, when the public get to use it. They've moved on to much more advanced technology by then. There are three levels of technology in use at all times. There's a the professorship down level, who believe everything they're told and the public believes everything they read in the science magazines are just starting to work on something and maybe one day in the future they will be able to and so on and then there's a CIA Mossad MI6 level where they have advanced gadgetry in the 1950s Nick Bigage has shown us they had the CIA had technology which could put direct voice to skull information right into your middle of your head from line of sight and you could put the gadget in your pocket antique stuff by today's standards the whole flying saucer scenario covered up the government making the darn things by getting the media to go into action and and even fronting groups to start up the whole alien thing. Well, it must be from the aliens because we don't have them. That's how easy it was to divert attention from black budget projects. Remember, there's always a good re reason given to the public. Then there's a real reason, which they're never told about. That's how you manage the public. That's what Francis Bacon and Machiavelli and other advisors to kings and queens talked about it's best not to let the public know the real purpose behind laws and institutions and movements 
as I say, you don't want to frighten the children, and that's how we are looked upon. Now, there's too many children, according to them, and we don't have a function anymore, and we might get unruly, in fact, if we don't have enough bread in circuses, like Mr. Huxley talked about. And they plan to deal with it all as they bring this world down. As it's uniting, we're going into the horror show. We're not all happy, smiling faces. We're going into economic depressions. Our whole life is to be regulated. All energy resources have been taken from our hands completely. And shortly it will be banned if you try and heat yourself to live and survive in a winter unless you use their designated fuel and if you have your place inspected to see if it's fit to use this fuel. This has happened already here in Canada. You'll probably be hung, drawn and quartered if you try and use wood in a wood stove because you'd be independent of the monetary system, the profit system which keeps you or will keep you in grinding poverty. You're going to be taxed for every BTU you use. You're going to pay through the nose for every little watt of electricity. And you're going to be trained now. The UN says we must be trained, we must train the public to cut back and back and back. And as they're training us to cut back the cost of electricity and all power is to vastly increase. The global plantation is underway. The food resources of the world are out of the public's hands in most countries. What's left for the public is modified by scientists who worked in secret agreements with governments. Admitted now. And these are the same boys who are bringing us in to a, a lovely world order where we're supposed to march in with balloons and, and, and skipping and hopping gaily, if you can still use that word gaily, like naive little children as a Pied Piper leads us to Utopia, which is actually Dante's Inferno. Big shock to people who think their countries have just been taken over now. Big shock. Terror, hype, fear to think you've just been taken over. You were born in a time when it really was already taken over. In the book I just read, they talked about the precursor and a setting up of a system which became NATO, which would link and bind and join at the hip Britain and the United States and Canada and eventually the rest of Europe. Go into the writings of Karl Marx, who wrote his, well, it wasn't his Communist Manifesto, he just wrote what he was told, but he wrote it in London and he was sponsored by the big foundations to do so. The richest corporations on the planet funded him to write it. And in there he said, in the 1800s, the world they'd bring into being would consist of three main trading blocks. A united Europe, the United Americas, and a Pacific Rim area. All with provincial governments, provinces, you see, under a super world government. And if you think it's still all coincidence, go back to dreamland. Follow rainbows, you might find a leprechaun at the end of it. With a pot of gold. Have an out of body experience play with your chakras wish it all better as we should tell the children when children skin their knees why don't you wish
wish it all better. Close your eyes and wish it all better. The whole New Age phenomena has disarmed the minds of millions of people. The circuses and the sports have disarmed most of the rest. They say there's nothing new under the sun. Perhaps so, except for the advance in psychology on a mass scale coupled with such a mass media. But the techniques are old. That is true. Very old techniques that unified ancient cultures. If a moneyed system had never come into being, you would have, over a vast amount of time, gradual integration of all peoples because young people, when their hormones work, don't really care what color someone is at all. You'd have a natural integration without conflict over a long period of time. It's happened in other countries too. When the Scots came into Scotland, the pigs already lived there and there's no records of wars, there was intermarriage and gradually they were assimilated into the Scots. That's happened in many other countries too. It's only when there's money behind it because they have an imperative of time running it towards business plans as they do that they bring in brute force and force things along or they use and pay for a massive immigration to come in to create conflict. I kind of get the feeling that um, from my research here on the ground I kind of get the feeling that the European governments are the ones that are actually behind this migrant crisis. They're the ones organizing the whole thing and they're using and Jovas is like, say, the children and the other ones, uh, more as a front group doing the dirty work for them. The policies of putting people in specific areas in large cities is a form of ghetto creation. To keep them separate, it doesn't help them disperse and integrate into the system. Because one day, you see, they can always use that conflict when it suits them. And that day will come when they start crashing the money system. Everyone can get along just, you see, in crowded cities, as long as the money's flowing for everything. When, it's, when it starts to get difficult to pay the rent, everyone's worried, conflicts begin, and people start subdividing back into original groups and fighting each other. The big boys count on these kind of things happening to bring in the brute force for the new system. So don't fight each other. We've got to rise above all of that. And don't be... Don't let good speakers stir up the emotions to such a pitch that the ordinary folk fight the other ordinary folk, regardless of their colour, creed or whatever. That's what they count on too, you see. When you see the big picture, we see the, I see the populations of the world facing the same horror show a non-thinking future for what will be left of what they call or we call humanity at the lower levels, which is the majority. A state of never being able to say, I think. It will be inconceivable to perceive of yourself as a distinct individual, as we've been told. The book I quoted from, I'm sure even that was whitewashed to an extent, but it does at least show you all the groups, the left and right, all the people who went back home and claimed they were for the working peoples, and the lords were there too, different lords, and they go back there and talk to their own peer group and have a little chuckle how they'd conned the public again or the people. And how I had them all on board, you see, on board and on track. 
the same agenda. Always with the promise of a bitter carrot to the end of the stick. Never fails. It's been a, a dry read for me, reading this old book here. Yet these are the books you have to plow through and stay awake to come to the understanding that is necessary to not combat this head on as they expect you to but to go off in a different tangent and the tangent comes with understanding what's really happening they expect people to lock horns with them they're masters of the chessboard with two sides. But we must find another way, which is not planned by them. You can't play the dialectic with these characters. From Hamish and myself, it's good night. And may your God, or your gods, go with you.
working class here always something to pay If you want to be a hero, well, just follow me If you want to be a hero, 